Yeah, so thanks, Mike. Um, thanks for having me out uh, to ScaleConf. I've had a, I've had a fantastic time. I had an opportunity to take a few minutes or a few days of vacation beforehand. Um, and I've been nothing. I had high, very high expectations for South Africa and Cape Town in particular. And, had, and my expectations have only been exceeded by the country, by this conference, by everything. Um, one of the experiences I had, though, is I decided I wanted, one day I wanted to drive down to the, the Cape of, uh, down the Cape to the bottom. Um, and I discovered about halfway through that trip that there was a raging wildfire going on that prevented, uh, prevented me to, uh, uh, from going down there. Um, and, and, you know, in some ways that kind of sums up kind of the, the state of where we are with our things in our lives. Um, although I probably should have looked at Google Maps or, um, or Bing Maps, of course. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, I, I, I should have looked at a mapping source of some sort to, to see if there was a, there was a problem. Um, I did it, and that kind of sums up how dumb that, that, you know, that kind of stuff is still, we have to go and pull for it, that information. Um, and so a lot of what my talk is about today is about cars. Um, it's about a practical project we're doing at Microsoft. So the team I work in goes out and does engineering work um, on things that we, that we believe are, that are for at least, you know, for Azure or for the industry as a whole haven't been done before. Um, and so the way I wanted to kind of motivate that is, and, and, and more generally, the, the shift that we're making in the industry um, is to kind of start from the beginning. Um, and so this has been our conception of a computer for a really long time, right? It's something that has a screen, um, it's something that has a keyboard, um, and so for three decades or more, this was a, this was a computer. Um, it had an input device that we typed on and we saw things come back on the screen. Um, that shifted in a big way about eight or nine years ago. Um, uh, computers became something that went with us all the time, and we're basically always on. And while it still has a screen, we, and, and, uh, uh, and it has a touch screen now instead of a keyboard, it's still fundamentally the same, uh, the same type of paradigm, right? We have a screen, we have some kind of input device, whoops, uh, um, and it still works in the same manner. Um, uh, there's a lot of ways we're, taking, we're, we're trying to move this kind of paradigm forward. This is the Microsoft Band. It's a, 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 essentially a, um, a, a fitness tracker with a number of other functions that go with it. And so in the industry, we're looking at ways of pushing this forward. But fundamentally, I believe that really the next, things, the next computing devices in our lives are going to be things like the car. Um, so you know, things that in our lives that we, that we already have, that already have existing user interfaces, and instead of there being a screen that you interact with, you interact with these things using um, the ways you expect already. Um, and so for the car, that's the steering wheel. Um, you also talk, you know, you know, you also interact with it, of course, we're using the gas pedal and the brakes and, and these other things. And while it might have a, a screen in the car, the, the fundamental user interface is those, are those things. Um, the good news is, though, um, uh, I don't know how many of you know this, but your car is already more or less a distributed computer. Um, and so uh, back in the late 80s, uh, car manufacturers came up with a bus. It's called the CAN bus. It essentially ties all these disparate systems together in the car. Um, uh, and so they communicate with each other over, a, over this bus. Um, that's how, that's how your, your, um, you know, your instrument cluster, or whatever they call it, I guess, um, communicates with you know, some of the, the, the body electronics in the back, so the power controls for your windows and, and whatnot. Um, and so these, this, this CAN bus is actually sending back and forth, and here's a picture of it. This is actually an ODD2 port. Um, and so every car um, that's in, uh, every car that's been manufactured since roughly the end of the 80s has a port like this in it. Um, and this port is responsible for kind of exposing that, that CAN bus that runs throughout the car um, to people that want to do diagnostics on it. That was the original purpose. Um, and so there's roughly, when, when you go into, so this is the uh, infamous port they pl plug into when you get a check, en check engine light. Um, and so you go into the repair center, they plug into this, and the car tells them what the, the check engine light is, right? Um, uh, the great news is, though, um, is that you can actually, sorry, as applied timings are obviously off, um, the good news is you actually can hook in hardware to this and actually get about 350 different pieces of information in the car um, uh, just by hooking into this. Um, and so we built actually a custom piece of hardware that does that. Um, the back end of that uh, connects into the car, and then the front end of this has, um, has GPS and a 3G modem for connecting and sending this up to the cloud. Um, there's a number of, of scenarios that we want to, and I'll walk through these one by one. There's a number of scenarios that you can make better when a car is already connected. 
Um, but the first problem you run into is just getting that data up into the cloud. Um, and I'm going to first talk through um, the challenges of ingesting, as, as we say in the, in the car industry says, uh, this, this data. Whoa. Um, uh, so uh, uh, this is a very simple you know, kind of block diagram of what's in this car client. Um, the first thing you, you learn when you work in the Internet of Things is the actual device um, is very difficult to work with. Um, uh, there's, uh, I, I, I understated the problem immensely by saying that it only has 128K of RAM. So um, it, 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 these are microcontrollers. Um, you program, I, I'm not, I kid you not, who knows what an AT command is? <laughs> All right, so you, you send an HTTP request using an AT command from the SDK for this microcontroller. Um, that is basically the state of the art uh, for, for these devices. There are a lot of, lot of ways that and a lot of people are working to improve that. Um, but that's, that's what you're kind of faced with, and that's you know, the mental model you should have for how hard it is to, to program this. And so the model that we're using, and model that, that seems to be kind of um, very quickly becoming kind of the norm in the industry, is, is a message-based approach. Um, and so every time we get a new location, I'm only showing a few of the telemetry things here, um, very grossly simplified, of course. Um, but every time there's a new location, or every time there, there's a, a piece of engine data we want to send up, we send that as a message up to, up to, um, up to the cloud. Um, and so that's the model we're doing. We send that up over 3G. Um, we also use a, a, a telemetry protocol called MQTT. Um, MQTT is a very, very simple pub-sub protocol. That's the way to think about it. Um, uh, and, it and it's primarily using the Internet of Things because it's simple. Uh, very low-end low devices like this microcontroller can actually implement it. Um, and so uh, the thing that you have to think about, though, when you start talking about very large fleets of devices, the thing you need to think about is, is the scale. Um, and so uh, uh, one of the, you know, we're, we're not actually talking to Avis. I'm using this as an example. Um, unfortunately, the customers we're working with, are, the, the project is still confidential because of what they're trying to accomplish. Um, but if you think about a company like Avis, a car hire company like Avis, that has roughly 122,000 cars in their fleet, um, Someone like that, they're, they're probably interested in sending up basically 35 data points, you know, the plus or minus, you know, some number of data points per second during the operation of that car. Um, and from talking to a number of these companies, it's basically each of these cars and their fleet are in operation on average about 45 minutes a day. Um, and so very quickly, you know, these numbers start to multiply against each other and you end up, you know, you know end up having 100,000 data points per day per car. Um, you know, 11 and a half billion data points are landing per day, um, and 133,000 of them per second. Um, and that's only, that's an average number, not peak, which is obviously very important. Um, so that, that number can be much higher in, in a peak rush hour or a Monday morning situation where everybody's flown in for their week of work somewhere. Um, and, you know, overall, you're, you're starting to talk about over 4 million data points, or trillion data points um, per year. And so the first thing that you really need to think about, I believe that, I really do believe that we are going to make a transition industry so that such that um, in the same way that it was inconceivable, there were, were most, more or less all of us are working on mobile, that I believe in 10 years we'll all look back and not believe that we didn't believe we were, we're going to work on things like this. Um, the first thing you need to think about when you're confronted with that first project is to make sure that the telemetry you're collecting, that you have some idea of how it's going to end up in tangible business impact. Because... You know, num with numbers like these, uh, even then you're going to still have, you know, um, a ton of data headed your way. Um, and so the, 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 basically the ingestion architecture that we've been, that, you know, that's kind of the canonical way of doing this. This is what we use at Nest. This is what we, you know, that, that we're using in this car project and, and beyond um, is essentially to have a, an MQTT or another protocol, kind of messaging protocol on the front end that we send up data to. Um, and so the cars are connecting over MQTT. Um, we authorize and authenticate the connection for MQTT, so it's a one-time connection uh, auth authentication against uh, uh, um, a service that we've built called the device registry. Um, and that's, re that's, that's responsible for making sure that, uh, that, that we believe that that's really the car, of course, and that the car has the identity we expect and this and that. Um, the data then flows into an ingestion service, which essentially, and I'll talk about that next, essentially lands that data in a couple of systems um, high scale storage and then a high scale event processing system. Um, and then finally, you don't just want to obviously just land the data, but you also want to process it, gain insights out of that. Um, and so now I'm going to talk about, I'm going to talk about those, those, those bottom two parts, the ingestion service and the, um, uh, uh, the data pipeline uh, uh, next about how those works. But I thought first I would talk about 
one of the problems that we're, they're working on, on solving with this pipeline. Um, so this is the very uh, prototype view of, of a, uh, a problem we're working on for a, a, a uh, car rental company um, that rents by the hire in Germany. Um, uh, and the, and the, the problem that they have is they rent these cars by the hour. Um, and so uh, the, the, the way this works is there's a number of lots spread out over the, um, over the city where you can pick up these cars and drop them off. Um, and one of the things that they, they, one of the problems they have is that uh, cars will get depleted from one lot and pile up at another lot. Um, and this tends to happen in bursts around, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, around, you know, just around, you know, days of the, times of the day and, 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 and days of the week. Um, and so they can some way, in some ways manage this already. They actually have people that will drive cars from different lots to other lots. Um, but one thing they want to be able to do is do an even better job. And part of that is being able to predict where a, someone that just rented the car is going to end up dropping off the car. Um, uh, and they can do that, they believe, they know this from the data that they already have from a, a small trial, is be able to predict. Like if you start in, uh, I can't see what that says, Osterfield or something like that, um, and you'll end up in uh, Harlan, um, up, uh, up in the north there. Um, and they, do, they usually can determine this within the first kilometer. Um, so it takes, it takes the first few turns. Drivers tend to, in, in this car fleet, because they use it in replacement of it, so they don't have their own car. They, they rent this for a lot of very common trips that they, they might need um, to use, that they can actually to predict that. Um, and so that's the kind of problem that we're, that's kind of business impact that we're, we're trying to provide at the enterprise level. And then also at the consumer level, we would like to, you know, to be able to tell that, that driver that there is a fire in that car, that, you know, that, that, that the, the road is blocked about halfway down the road. Um, I see that you know, you've gone, you've made all the turns that tells me you're headed that way. Um, you should know about that. Um, so we can more proactively and more in a more of a push style tell the end user as well and, and have them gain value from this service. Um, and so the data pipeline that we're using to do this um, uh, is, is, you know, to some extent probably what you'd expect. Um, so in Azure we have a, a set of, uh, of infrastructure called table storage. Um, uh, this is a very high scale kind of, uh, well, to uh, big table type of storage. Um, uh, that we can land a lot of data into um, repeatedly um, at high volume, uh, whatnot. Uh, so we're doing that. So we, that's the first, the first point where our raw data comes in and we, we immediately push it into, into table storage. Uh, we also push it into a second, uh, a second system called Event Hub. Um, for those who use AWS, it's like Kinesis. Um, it's a very high scale event, uh, event uh, ingestion system um, that allows you to take in a number of events and then, and, and then use it in, in back end systems. Um, like Storm that I'm going to talk about in a second. Um, the second thing we do is we immediately pull that data out uh, uh, periodically and put it into blob storage. Um, this lines it up for Hadoop. Uh, we use Hadoop pretty extensively in this, um, in this system to do a number of tasks. Um, uh, most, most importantly, to do a lot of data cleansing tasks. So we get a lot of um, uh, the data coming in from the Internet of Things tends to be very dirty. Um, uh, and I mean that in the sense that it... Uh, uh, that the GPS points for location can be wildly off um, because of, of satellite error or other anomalies. And you know, one of the initial steps that you have to take is actually cleaning that data before it can be, um, you want to pass it into a learning system such that they don't, uh, they don't have to fight through all the noise to, to find the signal. Um, and then, so, so that, that, that Hadoop system does that, that, that cleansing and summarization um, and builds data uh, derivative data that's then passed in the table storage again. Um, and then the, the, we also use Storm, and I'll talk about in a second. Storm is in a real-time event processing system, and that also is used to do some of that, where we need that, those results in real time, as opposed to in a batch, uh, uh, batch kind of time frame. Um, and then finally, we use a, a machine learning to do some of these things, to be able to do uh, destination prediction, um, driver risk scoring that I'll talk about uh, a little bit later, um, to, to be able to predict you know, where, where someone's going to end up and push that back into table storage and then surface it into um, the applications for some definition of application. Um, and so I, I think a lot of people have run into to Hadoop, um, but I thought I would go into more detail about, um, about uh, Apache Storm and, um, and Azure Machine Learning to kind of uh, explain those, those steps. Um, and so what Storm allows you to do at the, at the highest level is take one incoming stream of information um, and transform it into another stream of information. Um, and so we use it, uh, uh, we use it in, in the Connected Car Project to actually filter out uh, erroneous 
uh, location information. So you can see here there's, there's, um, uh, there's a you know, stream of locations coming in. I marked the one in red. This represents some kind of uh, anomaly, like they drove through a tunnel and their GPS kind of went, you know, it, it reported an invalid, invalid location. Um, uh, we filter those out by, by looking and saying, okay, it's not possible this car went, you know, 1,500 kilometers an hour um, between these two, these two time stamps. Um, uh, and so so we, I think we can safely assume that that's probably an erroneous, erroneous uh, uh, data point, especially when we, we can look at it across both, both sides of it. Um, and so we, then we strip it out and, uh, oops, sorry, uh, and, then, and then pass it along. We also use it to do um, uh, driver uh, or session summarization. So uh, detecting how a, a, a particular drive session and then summarizing it in terms of, of time and distance. Um, and so what this looks like when you need to model something like this in Apache Storm um, uh, is, is you, you essentially there's two concepts, two key concepts in Apache Storm. There's a source and a bolt. Um, and so a source, is, or sorry, a, a spout and a bolt. Um, the spout is essentially a source of, of, of events that come into the system. Um, and so we're using that to, you know, our raw location feed comes in. Uh, we do location filtering and we emit that out into a, a cleansed location stream. Um, uh, the bolt is what does the processing. So that bolt does the, has the algorithm that knows how to look at a stream and essentially do filtering on it uh, and, and emit only the location events that it thinks are valid. Um, what's great about Storm is you can actually push the, 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 the output of one of those bolts into another bolt. Um, uh, and so we're using that actually to do uh, session, or, you know, we're, we're using that for um, session, session identification because we don't want... Um, we don't want that invalid GPS data to actually cloud, um, you know, where not we think a driver session has ended or, or started. Um, and we also pa pass in, you know, you also have the opportunity to pass in other data, like a, a door is a, a jar in the car, or the ignition uh, ignition state, which obviously is a pretty strong indicator that the driving session has ended. Uh, we pass that in, and we use that to those two pieces of things that compute, um, you know, great statistics around the, the a summarization of the driver session. Um, so in general, we've had a really good, uh, really good success with Apache Storm. For anything you need to, uh, it is more expensive to operate, in, in, in my experience, uh, uh, to operate than uh, running a, a Hadoop kind of batch style uh, approach. But it gives you real time results. Um, and so the next thing I thought I would talk about is a little bit around the, the machine learning aspects. Um, so another thing we want to be able to do is, um, in our system is, is do uh, driver risk scoring. Um, and so driver risk scoring is the idea that you, you measure risky events inside the car. Um, typically in an enterprise fleet, like a, a, a shipping company, would want to look and, and understand you know, if, the, if there's the, uh, different levels of risk uh, between different, different drivers and or a, a user, uh, kind of a user, uh, kind of gamifying the, the, the driving experience to let them know about things that they could be doing better, um, either from an efficiency perspective or from a risk perspective. Um, and so the, the way we do this is, is in any, uh, um, so any, any supervised machine learning uh, problem, uh, and supervised in this, this sense means that we have a training set versus unsupervised, which would be clustering and things where you don't actually know the answer to the problem, and you're trying to find it. Um, and so supervised machine learning, we actually have a data set of driving that we're using um, that we've classified as good driving or bad driving. Um, so little, little segments of driving uh, that we use to train up a, an algorithm. And in our case, we're using a neural network. Um, and the first thing you need to do when you do supervised uh, machine learning is actually split your data. And so you have a training data set, and then you have the test data that you use to, to verify that. Um, and so we have, we have this data set, we split it, uh, we train a model using the algorithm, and then we score it against the, tr the test data. And the reason it's important to split that is because otherwise you can, you, can, you can tend to overfit your model um, against the training data. Um, and holding back some of the test data allows you to verify that it will actually work on, on real-world data. Um, and so in our, in our project, we're using a, a, a thing in, uh, in, in Azure called Azure Machine Learning. Uh, this is the studio. You can just, it's almost impossible, I'm sorry, to, to see this. But it is, it's basically the, the slide from the, from the before. Um, it's just in the, the user interface where you can specify these input sources, um, the data sets you're using to train it. Um, and then you can use, it has a, a, a experimental studio for going through and, and, um, and seeing how the, the model actually uh, uh, tests against that, that data and the, the, the test data. Um, 
This is an example of how we're using it in the project. And so here we've classified, um, running it against the, the incoming data, we've classified some segments as having harsh, harsh breaking, breaking segments. Um, um, and then other segments as having you know, high risk uh, turning scenarios. Um, uh, and we've used that to essentially classify these different, these different sections of, of, of driving by this particular, this particular user. Um, so that's kind of a high level view of how we do the, the pipeline and you know, some, of the, some of the elements that when you start thinking about the, the Internet of Things that you can use you know, to build essentially experiences based on the context of just a, a driver simply driving around. Um, no talk about the Internet of Things I think would be com completely complete without talking about how you go about deploying some of this. Um, you know, the, 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 the fortunate fact that we have in industry now is that our cloud providers provide us a lot of the, the infrastructure we need to land this very high skill data. I did it the first time at Nest Labs. It was very, very difficult. So we didn't have things, you know, like, like table storage or like DynamoDB or like Bigtable to do it. Um, and now we do. Um, so I thought I would focus actually on how we're um, uh, deploying the API. Um, and so this is our, our API in, um, uh, for, for this. Essentially, we have three services that, we, um, that are running. These are all, all Node.js uh, uh, APIs, essentially. Um, uh, but we have three, three back-end services that are, are consolidated using a front door um, API, API layer um, uh, that essentially proxies a request into the right back-end server. Um, the front door also does uh, authentication, initial authentication of the client, um, and, um, and whatnot. Um, so the ingestion service is one we've talked a lot about. Device registry does the auth and, and, and querying for discovery of devices. Um, and the consumption service we haven't talked a lot about, but essentially it surfaces that data. So all that insight that we generated using machine learning um, and the batch style and real-time methods before, it surfaces that back to, to the applications. Um, and so we have these, we have these the essentially four services that we need to deploy. Um, uh, so, you know, in terms of sizing, it's about, it goes through the same mechanism you, you, you know, you'd, you'd expect. We had, we have roughly two seconds or two messages that we're sending up per vehicle and, and one of the, and one of the, the, the fleets that we're, we're helping um, uh, uh, build um, or build the, ton, or the monitoring around. Um, and 37% of that, the, the, that uh, peak uh, concurrent usage of that car fleet is typical. Um, there's roughly 30,000 cars. Uh, and you basically work out that we need to be able to handle a 60,000 message load from the car fleet uh, every, every second. Um, our ingestion instances can handle 1,000 messages per second and basically work out to 60 ingestion instances, you know, and using similar math, uh, 20 you know, front door instances that does the API uh, consolidation. 10 consumption instances and, and five device registry instances. Um, and so it's, you know, while it's not a, you know, a gigantic deployment, um, uh, there's, enough, there's enough instances going on here that, you know, just, uh, you know, de de deploying it, uh, you know, without uh, any, any sort of infrastructure to help you uh, surround it um, uh, was, uh, you know, was something that would be a challenge. Um, uh, and we initially, you know, thought about using something like Chef or Puppet, uh, kind, of, kind of traditional methods for configuring these servers. Um, but our team uh, likes to do it the hard way, um, uh, and by the hard way I mean the bleeding edge, and so we've, we chose Docker um, uh, to do this, and I, you know, I thought it would be interesting to kind of explain uh, our experiences with that and some of, the, some of the, um, the things that build on top of Docker that we used as part of this talk to, to kind of share that experience. Um, I will say at the outset that we, we struggled to get this working with, with Docker. Um, that said, I love Docker. Um, I, think it was, it was, it, I think it is the future, but we did struggle to, to some extent um, to, to get it working. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar with what Docker is, essentially Docker allows you to run a, a, a containerized workload versus a VM-based workload. And what the difference is between a, a VM and a container is that in a virtual machine, every instance has a copy of the, of the guest OS, while as an, in a container, they can share that, that operating system. Um, they can also share binaries and libraries uh, if, 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 you, if you structure it that way. Um, and the, maybe the, in the case it's not obvious from this, you, you pay that, the price you pay for that is a little bit in security because there's not as much isolation between the, the application instances running on Docker. Um, uh, that said, it, it, has a very, it has a fantastic way of, sp of specifying what goes on each of these servers, and you can build these, these servers in a hierarchical manner. Um, this is a, a definition of the uh, Nginx server that we use in, in, across all those servers to uh, the, the front end proxy of it. Um, we build upon that then to, to build up the definitions for all these different application servers, the ingestion server, the front door, and, and beyond. Um, 
Uh, and so I, I'm a huge fan of this. This is, this is fantastic. Um, but then you ha end up, what this leaves you with, though, is a, is a set of container images that you then need to deploy across this, you know, roughly uh, 100 core uh, deployment that you'd like to do. Um, and, you know, without anything else, that, that, that really means you end up spend, spinning up a certain number of VMs and, and deploying uh, your, your Docker containers on top of that. Um, to me, that was, you know, that, that kind of felt like I was missing the point. Um, and fortunately, it looks like other people caught on to that as well. Um, and so we're actually using something called CoreOS to actually deploy these containers to a cluster. Um, for those of you who haven't run into CoreOS before, um, it is a stripped down Linux distro. And when I mean stripped down, it's really stripped down. It has no package manager. Um, and basically, it's been designed to, as, as its sole purpose in life, is to run, uh, uh, run containers. Um, it's also auto-updating, um, and so it's built on some of the same technology that the Chromium project uses to update browsers. Um, and it's built around using uh, System D. So if, if folks haven't run into System D, it's the kind of the next generation, or some ne definition next generation, a NIT system in, in Linux um, that uses unit files to schedule work with, with you know, on top of a machine. Um, CoreOS builds on top of that with a, with a set of tooling called Fleet Control that allows you to deploy uh, these unit files across the fleet of, 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 of servers. Um, and so, for instance, what the typical usage of this is to actually say, I want to deploy this Docker container using this unit file across, um, well, 60, 60, uh, 60 cores, like I, 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 I described in the, in the instance, uh, or the ingestion instances that we wanted to deploy. Um, it also includes a distributed init system called etcd. Uh, etcd allows you to put configuration, kind of 12-factor style, one place, and then have all your your cluster instances uh, query for that to find, you know, define that, that configuration instances, connection strings, um, you know, any or any configuration uh, information you want to share between instances, um, and all of this, all of this to back up is is building towards this, you know, the, the punchline for core OS is where is where that is that, and I believe the systems that are being built like it is to get you to think in, in a warehouse computing style, and by that I mean that you start thinking about the cores that you're, you're running your application on uh, instead of the virtual machines. Um, and so instead of thinking about, um, I need to spin up you know, uh, eight virtual machines to, with eight cores each to run you know, 60 instances of, of my application, you're thinking about having a, a core OS cluster that has a capacity of about 200 cores, um, and then letting things like core OS uh, schedule those containers onto your cluster. Um, and using you know some rules to, to spread them oops, to spread them uh, amongst the, the different the different machines in the cluster. Um, so the, the, the so it's great. So this is great. So you have now now we we've built we've moved up the abstraction one more layer, right? We have these containers now. I can say I want to deploy 60 of them out to my cluster. The complexity of this is that well then how do I route incoming requests to the right containers? Um, uh, and so there's 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 a number of projects that have spun up to, to, to work on that problem. Um, and the one we chose is called Deus. Um, and so what Deus provides you is a sort of, um, it provides you that routing. So as a request comes in, um, it will actually uh, uh, route them to the right container running in your infrastructure uh, that's running your application. Um, one of the other great things that it provides is uh, a git push development style. Um, and so. For those of you who use Azure websites or, or Heroku, um, this is used to be very familiar to you, essentially having a Git repo that you push to, to Deus. And it works, it does all of the complexities around um, uh, building a new Docker container with that application image and then pushing it out to, uh, pushing it out to your, your, your CoreOS cluster and then flipping over to the new, new application instance. Um, it also does log consolidation, so as your application is running in all these various different, different containers, it collects all those logs and combines them into one logical view that you can do ops against. Um, and what else? Yeah. Um, so this is, a, this is, you know, so Deus builds on top of CoreOS, and underneath this it's running on, on top of CoreOS. CoreOS builds on top of Docker. Um, and finally, when we got to this, we had, you know, essentially what we wanted, which was we had, you know, uh, you know, a set of a, a, a set of instances that are spread across, um, uh, not instances, sorry, a set of containers spread across the cluster. Um, Deus provides the request routing uh, into, uh, you know, to the right container. So the, you know, a, 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 a consumption request lands on a consumption container. An ingestion request lands on in an ingestion container. Um, 
And we have CoreOS monitoring all these containers. So when one goes down, it'll automatically spin up another one. Um, so, you know, it kind of in summary, I think, you know, uh, you know the, our belief, uh, my belief, uh, is that context is really over the next 10 years is going to become really the next interface, It'll be the primary interface, which we, we interact with computing. Obviously, the other, other ways won't go away. Um, uh, and collecting context is very high scale by its nature. Um, you know, the, the, the project I showed there, I think in the end will be considered a small project. I think, you know, if you start thinking about an auto manufacturer that rolls out this sort of telemetry system for all of their cars, um, it'll be several orders of magnitude even larger than that. Um, and we need, you know, because of that, we need new approaches to, to store this data. I think our the cloud vendors, including Microsoft, have, have done, helped us a lot, you know, gone a long way to helping that. Um, we also need new ways of processing this data, like, like Storm I talked to today, and then Hadoop, like we've, you know, a lot of us are familiar with now. Um, and then finally, we need ways to, to, to learn against this data. Um, uh, so Azure ML is, is, is the one that, that we provide in Azure, but there's obviously like the prediction API from, uh, from, from Google um, and others that you can use to actually provide insight on top of this data because it's not just enough to collect it. You obviously want to be able to, to, to process it and then be able to make predictions and classifications based off of it. Um, uh, so I make one, one you know, final kind of uh, uh, to um, uh, talk about the, 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 so the whole framework that we built around this that I've, I've described in this talk, we open sourced as part of uh, the project that we've been doing. Um, it's called Nitrogen. It's at nitrogen.io if you're interested. Uh, if you tackle project Internet of Things, uh, uh, you know, uh, we, we would love to, uh, you know, love for you to use it and uh, provide feedback and, and pull requests. And um, thanks for listening. I'll be here and uh, obviously I'll take questions and I'm on Twitter if you're getting this after the fact, so. Brilliant. Cool. Thanks, Tim. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, cool. We'll take questions. I actually have a question. Um, yeah. the, when, I was, when I was looking at the machine learning part, you uh -huh. talked about splitting the, the data and having your test data and your, your reference data, et cetera. Yep. When, when you're, I understand why you would want to do that from a, uh, so you can validate what you're expecting to occur. Yep. But as you learn and you then change things in your system so that you activate the learnings into, into code, uh -huh. how then is, have you seen the, what you need to, compl do you need to keep revisiting that learning process and keep rebuilding your, Validated test data. And does that become? Does that job become worthwhile? Yeah. So though know, you know, you, you, you initially you have to do a lot of that. So there's a lot of iterative. Um, you, have, you have to take a very iterative approach to it. Um, you, you you build a model. You 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 go and see how it works in the real world. Um, and you have to do that kind of frequently until you find the, the you know the right model that kind of fits the um, what you want to classify or predict. Um, I think over time. It, 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 uh, I think the way that it would change is if you start having new signals that you want to, you know, pass in. Like if you suddenly can start collecting, um, at the beginning we only had location information for the, the driving session, you know, splitting out those driving sessions, and then we started being able to collect, you know, the, the, the door had been open and closed and the ignition had been turned on and off. Obviously those are very strong signals for a driving session, and so uh, we, when you get new signals like that, you want to, you obviously want to, or new, you know, columns or, or, or things that go into your, into your, 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 your machine learning algorithm, um, then you obviously want to revisit it because it can obviously make the model a much, you know, much better model. So, um, yeah, I, I think, in, you know, in general, it's just, it, it, if you see something you can make better, I think you, you, know, you take the opportunity to make it better and, and experiment with it. Cool. Any other questions? I was just interested in the uh, Storm Hadoop side by side. Yeah. Uh -huh. One being uh, stream based, the other one being more batch based. Uh, could you expand a little bit on exactly? Uh, are they achieving the same outcome? No, they're not. So we only um, we only use Apache Storm for the uh, for the algorithms that we need in in near real time. Um, uh, otherwise, we're using um, otherwise we're using Hadoop to do kind of batch style um, processing of the data. Um, so we use we typically use um, uh, if and, and if if so the location information goes through Storm because you know there's the cleansing that I showed because we immediately need that to do route prediction um, and so that's a good example so we need that uh, immediately but we don't need immediately 
uh, the summarization of um, uh, for a particular driver where where, they, where their their location clustering is. So instead, we run that in 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 Hadoop. Um, uh, we're still, you know, this is the first project that we had done with with Storm. So I think we're still kind of figuring out where the right where the right sweet spot is for Hadoop versus versus Storm. Um, I mean, so it, you know, I don't want to sound like an advertisement, but in, in Azure, it's easy to spin up clusters of both of those. So Apache Storm or Apache Hadoop. So we we spin up a cluster when we need it. Um, uh, and so for the Storm cluster, that's up more or less would be up more or less all the time. Um, and then the Hadoop cluster would only come up when we need. Uh, we want to do kind of like massive uh, kind of uh, uh, summarization or and or, or bulk cleaning of data. So, and it's not time sensitive. Yeah, the the, the inputs. So. Um, okay. Hi, I have a question following on what um, Mike asked. Uh -huh. It's also about the machine learning part. Okay. Uh, so, when your storm is busy handling all the, the data that's incoming, and you're actually working through all your bolts, and you you're actually forward propagating that information that you're getting from it, and redefining what your your search criteria is. How do you avoid uh, massive complications in that sort of data and, and wind up with a scaling problem where you don't actually know what you're searching for, how you're searching for, and um, I think you understand. Yeah, we've only used Storm for really straight, if I understand your question correctly, we've only used Storm for really straightforward problems that we have very simple algorithms for, like the location cleaning, uh, the cleansing algorithm we're using. Um, and so we haven't used it for very anything that requires a lot of state or anything that requires a lot of um, a lot of computation. It's more kind of simple uh, now next kind of, of, of algorithms or or directly on the data. Um, uh, uh, so we haven't. So we, we didn't we didn't push it. We haven't probably pushed it as far as it could go in terms of using some, using it for more complex algorithms that we could store a lot of state and use that to to build up a you know a very sophisticated you know real time result. Um, that's where I would start seeing there being a lot of, of scale problems because as soon as you start using a lot of instant or a lot of memory on the on the bolts, you can run into trouble. Um, so the bolts the bolts can actually retain state a little bit of state um, as part of the as part of the instance. Um, and so uh, we didn't really push that very hard. We more or less kept the last location around for every every car um, and then kept a summary table that we were adding to uh, for doing the the real time summary data. So that didn't end up being a lot of data per per device that we were monitoring, essentially. But if you start doing more sophisticated algorithms, you could very quickly run into memory scaling issues. And if you did very complicated algorithms, you can run into CPU issues uh, on the bolts. But I also grossly undersimplified the, the, the topology of what that actually looks like in, in, a, in a physical deployment. There's many, many bolts running across many, many machines. Um, uh, and so uh, the, you know, one of the things you can do is you can actually route the, 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 the incoming message streams to, can have an affinity with a particular uh, bolt. So, yeah. Thanks. Okay. Hi. Um, yeah, we, we're very interested to see that you, that you decided on, on the core OS thing because you also identified that maybe what we should use next. I want to ask you actually about Node. You, I yeah. said you use Node and if you would choose again, would you use Node again or would you use something else? Or, uh, what's your current thinking on that? Yeah, so we used Node um, because uh, we, we had a, a, a two sets of customers that wanted to run on two separate sets of, uh, initially, the, the very beginnings of the, the, the project we did, we wanted to run on two different operating systems. So uh, before the Dockerized deployment of this, we had some that were running on, on Windows and we had some that were running on Linux, uh, and, and Node allowed us to run on both of those. Um, so that was the two, that was the original uh, kind of uh, the reason that we chose Node. Um, <clears throat> Uh, going forward, I, 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 we've, I, I've really never had a problem. Node was uh, surprisingly drama-free in this deployment. I mean, um, we always have run a, very, a fairly over-provisioned uh, uh, server infrastructure, so we haven't really pushed it very hard either. Uh, we'd rather just have, the, um, have a, a spare capacity versus pushing it up against its limits. Um, and we're, you know, we're doing the things that we're using Node for. Node is really good at, right? Node does does a really good job at doing proxies. It does a really good job of doing APIs, in my opinion. Um, those are the APIs that are very simple. They're just passing data through to um, some backend system. So, um, uh, so you know, from my perspective, Node was a was, was you know has ended up being a fantastic choice from all those kind of dimensions. Um, yeah. yeah I, I, I mean, there, I mean, there's, there's, we could have, could have implemented this a number of different ways, and that was because of the initial thing we were working with, um, the constraint we were working with. We, we chose that. So, yeah. uh, Hi, my question's two part. Yeah. Uh, you kept on referring to the model for the machine learning algorithm. Yeah. Does that imply that you didn't use like a committee machine, you just used one single neural network machine model? 
And uh, regardless of whether you use a committee or not, um, in terms of retraining it with new data, if yeah. you add that in or not, um, does that scale, you know, does that problem scale? Does that complexity scale? Have you used one that scales well or something with like back propagation, which obviously wouldn't scale as well? Yeah, so, um, um, so, so Azure Machine Learning is built on um, the machine learning stuff that we used actually to, to, train, uh, to train Bing. So Bing, it's built on this so basically a platform organization of the, the technology that's been running for years for Bing. Um, and so it's, it's built to, to solve far bigger problems than even this, uh, you know, to be able to do machine learning across, you know, billions and billions of documents. Um, uh, uh, for that particular, for the particular, the, the specifics of the, of the, um, of the, the neural network, we, that, that wasn't a problem we ran into. It probably could be at a, at a larger scale or, or more, more complex problems. The, the, driver, the driver risk classification tended to be, was actually fairly easy to look at the data and kind of and for it to kind of converge on a model that was able to, to test against it. I could see it, you know, for a more sophisticated thing where it had to look at, we essentially were passing in uh, seven or eight signals into, into the, the neural network, the, the, you know, around the, the braking and the, and, the, and, the, and the steering wheel and, and, dif and different things to, to, to come up with that, um, to come up with that um, classification. Um, I could see with a much more complex set of, uh, of inputs to something that you could, you could run into you know, scaling issues. Um, uh, the API that you know, this produces the model, then you know, essentially you get as an API that you can use in, 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 your, in your system. Um, that again is, is, is using a lot of the same infrastructure we use for, we use for Bing, so it's, it scales out as well. So based on the complexity of the model, it automatically scales out the API servers based on the, the amount of traffic that you expect to your API service to receive. So, um, so that wasn't an issue for us. It's a little bit opaque to us, um, outside of the cost, um, but uh, about how it's being deployed, uh, but uh, which is a good thing. Uh, there's enough complexity as there was, um, uh, uh, but it, it, it's built to it's built to, to handle the, the complexity of the model that you're doing uh, uh, classification or predictions against, and it scales it appropriately underneath. Um, you use a lot of non-Microsoft technologies. Yes. Yeah. Is, is that even legal <laughs> at Microsoft? <laughs> yes. Welcome to the next Microsoft. So, uh, so uh, in this, yes. So in the new, yes. As, as of the new regime, it is completely allowed at Microsoft to use kind of what works best. Um, and so in, um, our team does a lot of that, and so that's particularly why we were put on this project, um, is that the car, the car companies wanted to use a lot of these different stacks um, uh, and, uh, and use these different mechanisms to do it. Um, uh, and so yes, so it, these, these were great, you know, you know, honestly these were, you know, there's a lot of windows in there too, like all that infrastructure that's, storing the data and everything else's windows as well. So there's a lot of traditional Microsoft in there as well. Um, but these technologies were what, you know, work, you know, essentially going to where the developers are at these car companies. These are the technologies that work for the, those, those developers. And so we, we did it in, you know, using, the, using that style. And all that stuff works great on, you know, and it's, it's I, always, I always get people who are surprised that this stuff works well on Azure. But yeah, it's been designed over the last few years. Um, to to you know to to be able to work you know to run these workloads as well all these open open platform workloads so.